also hello from my side to the audience. And since this is the first time I've been recorded and streamed to the internet, also hello to the internet. Um, and my name is Christoph, as already mentioned in a nice introduction. And this is joint work with uh, Maria, Thomas, Victor, and Florian. And for the people who might know what they usually do, I usually do uh, cryptanalysis, so they might wonder why is this guy doing fraud attacks now. And this is the first thing I want to talk about, our intention, why we did this work, and give a short overview about this work. Um, so what you will see in this work are the first um, practical published fraud attacks on a broad range of authenticated encryption schemes which work in a non-respecting scenario. So back then when we started with our work, uh, pretty much uh, every published attack on authenticated encryption scheme uh, schemes happened in a non misuse scenario since in case of the most prominent fraud attacks, the attacker must have the ability to uh, process the same input or related inputs to a scheme uh, more than once in order to get uh, 40 or correct ciphertexts, for instance. And in the case of authenticated encryption, this is pretty much recruited due to the existence of the nonce. Uh, so we did this work to counteract the impression that the sole existence and correct use of the nonce is a sufficient countermeasure against fraud attacks. Um, this work is not intended to uh, compare algorithms or make certain authenticated algorithms bad uh, just because one explicit uh, fraud attack work, work on unprotected implementations of these algorithms. So to all designers of the authenticated encryption schemes we discuss, please don't be uh, offended by uh, the work we did. Our intention was not to show weakness weaknesses of algorithms. It's just uh, to point out that fraud protection is uh, also necessary in the case of authenticated encryption. So the reason why we just look at uh, block cipher based mode of operations which either use AES or some block cipher which uses the AES round functions is first of all that there exist a lot of such modes. And second of all, um, it's that due to the uh, nice and elegant structure of AES, it's quite uh, easy to demonstrate how the attacks work. Um, our attacks are based on work of Four et al, which has been uh, presented at FTDC in 2013. And for the attack, we assume that an attacker is able to change the distribution of intermediate values with the help of words. So uh, to show that our assumptions about the words is uh, somehow reasonable, uh, we, and with we, I mean uh, Thomas and Victor, uh, did Ford experience on several different hardware platforms to show the practical feasibility of these fraud attacks. So uh, first of all, uh, how do our fraud attacks work in the case of an attack on plain AS? So as you can see here, uh, I've pictured the last two rounds of AS, uh, where the uh, big squares here symbolize the whole state of AS separated by the single round functions here, so we have mixed column, subbyte, shift rows, and FT. And the small case, uh, small squares here uh, represent the single byte values of the state. So in the case of AES, if we encrypt different uh, plain texts under the same secret key and look at the distribution of the single byte values we get, we will get a uniform distribution as far as we know. Uh, and this is also true uh, if the uh, inputs are not distributed uniformly. In the case of uh, AS, we can also quite safely assume uh, that also the single byte values uh, in the second to last round 
are uh, uniformly distributed. What the attacker now tries to do is to influence the distribution of one single byte value just before the last application of mixed columns so that this byte value is now non-uniformly distributed. For instance, an attacker can do this by faulting the processing of this S-box here. And all an attacker now has to do is uh, encrypt several plain texts, trying to fault the encryption, collect the cipher texts, and guess uh, the four key bytes of the last wrong query which are needed to decrypt the bytes marked in gray, and decrypt one word backwards, and check the distribution for each key guess made here. And we expect the distribution for wrong key guesses uh, of this byte to be closer to uniform than for the right key guess. So, um, and what we also tried to do in this attack is that we tried to reduce the assumptions we make on the capabilities of an attacker and what an attacker can do as much as possible. So for instance, we do not assume uh, anything about the distribution we get here uh, due to the faults besides that it is has to be non-uniform. And also, we do not assume anything about uh, the amount of faults an attacker makes or the exact position where he faults. We just rely on the effects of the faults. And also, um, it is also not a big problem if a fault shows no effects at all. All that it does is that it changes the distribution here, uh, which is overall then closer to uniform. So in the case of uh, authenticated encryption schemes, uh, to check if the attack is in principle applicable, uh, we, have to, uh, we have the scheme to fulfill two requirements. So uh, the first requirement is that a block cipher call which should be attacked uh, should uh, process uh, different inputs for each forward and the inputs uh, do not have to be known. And the second uh, requirement we have is that we need to know the output of the block cipher which is forwarded. So uh, first of all, uh, let's have a look at the ISO IEC uh, standard, uh, CCM, ERX, GCM, and OCP. So uh, we will attack the, the encryptions of the schemes, and since the CCM, ERX, and GCM all use a counter mode for encryption, I will just uh, show how the attack works on CCM and for OCP it's a bit different, which we will see later. So um, here you can see CCM, and as the name implies, it's a counter mode with CPC Mac. And for instance, uh, in a fourth attack, we can try to uh, attack the first block of the encryption, as you can see here, in a nonce respecting mode, the nonce changes for every encryption, so we will get always different inputs. And also if the plain text is known, we know the output of the block cipher and the attack I've shown it before works in a similar way to CCM. If we now look at OCB, the situation changes a bit, uh, especially if we look at the encryption of complete blocks here. As you can see, um, OCB uses a secret mask values uh, which mask the input and the output of the block cipher. Uh, while this is not a big problem if the input is masked since we do not require the input of the block cipher to be known at all, it's quite uh, tricky if the output of the block cipher is masked. Luckily, in the case of OCB, we uh, have the way how the, an incomplete last block is processed which differs from the complete block. So here, as before, if you know the plain text, you know the output of the block cipher and you can do the simple AES attack. Um, so far we have only dealt with schemes which we call in the um, 
paper basic construction because basically the AS attack applies. But as we've seen we, uh, with uh, OCB, we have also the case where input and outputs of uh, block ciphers are masks, which we call XCX-like constructions, and also we have quick work block ciphers. Uh, so first, we are going to deal with the XCX-like constructions. As I've mentioned, the masks uh, that are used are secret, uh, and this is the problem why ca we cannot access the output of the block cipher, so uh, this value uh, always depends on the secret key, independent of how a concrete scheme implements it. But additionally to the case that it only depends on the secret key, we also have the case where it additionally depends on the nonce and also therefore changes for every invocation of the authenticated uh, encryption scheme. So, but first, uh, we will focus on the case where it just depends on the secret key. And we, we give us an example of a scheme which is such an XX-like construction according to us uh, with uh, COPA, which is a CISA candidate, but it's not the only scheme where the attack works. And for instance, it also works on LMB. So here you can see the encryption of COPA. Um, we have this value V here, which just depends on the nonce and, uh, and associated data. And we also have this value L here, which is the encryption of zero. This value L is also used to mask the inputs and the outputs of the block cipher calls you can see here. However, uh, this value is uh, not nonce dependent. So if we again focus on this first uh, block, which gives us the cipher text, the masking value does not change over multiple invocations of, this, uh, of the scheme. So we can basically do the following. Uh, we can treat uh, this two times L part as part of the last round key, which is used uh, in AES, and apply the statistic fault attack to uh, recover this last round key. And then, if this key is recovered, we can either repeat the attack to recover the round key of round nine, or we, ca uh, we can recover the equivalent round key of the upcoming block cipher call and then solve this linear system of equations. But in both cases, the attack complexity, meaning the number of needed forts, is doubled. So now we also have the two cases uh, where the value of data k depends on the nonce and therefore changes. So in the case, in the first case, uh, we assume that the value of that depends on the key and on the nonce can be calculated independently, which means that we can uh, uh, remove the influence of the nonce uh, on the cipher text and then perform the attack which we have seen before in a quite straightforward manner. However, if the masking value changes for every invocation of the block cipher in an unpredictable way, uh, there's no way to apply the attack in a straightforward way and someone has to look at the concrete scheme to make any uh, assumptions on how this uh, fault attack carries over. So last but not least, we will uh, have a look at Twickable block ciphers, and there we have picked the uh, CISA candidates, uh, Deoxys and Chiasso, which both use the AS round function. So as you can see here, uh, with the help of Twickable block ciphers, you can design authenticated encryption schemes in a quite elegant way, from my perspective. So all what what you have to do in this uh, OCB-like mode is to encrypt the plain text, uh, plain text and the sum of the plain text under different tweaks here. Now we can again focus on the first block, and as you can see here, we have access to the input and access to the output, but of course, we have to see how uh, the two-equivalent block cipher works to check if the attack is applicable. Uh, and in the case of uh, the Oxys PC-256 is used as Twickable block cipher, it is, just because of the reason that we can uh, calculate the influence of the tweak 
of each round separately from the influence of the key. So the attacker knows the round week values here and the key part keeps, keeps constant. So we do not have any problems in the key recovery attack and can, uh, can do the fourth attack in the same way as on AES. So now let's come to the summary. Um, those are all the schemes where we have uh, concluded that the attack works. But keep in mind, this is not a complete list. We have had a quite restricted look at schemes, uh, just on AS-based schemes. And also, I want to point out again that we do not show uh, weaknesses of algorithms. We just want to point out that protection against fault attacks is needed. Now let's come to the verification or the implementation of the fault attacks. So in principle, what Victor and Thomas did uh, was to execute two different uh, ways to insert the forts. So the first way was by using clock glitches, and the second way was using a laser to forward intermediate values. So the help of clock glitches, they attacked uh, a general purpose microcontroller, uh, where either AES was running as a software implementation or an AES hardware coprocessor of it, and also with the laser they attacked the smart card microcontroller, or more concretely the AES coprocessor of the smart card uh, microcontroller. And in short, the results show that key recovery is possible with a small number of 40 staff attacks. So to get more insight, uh, here is the attack on an ATX Mega 256A3. Uh, this uh, microcontroller was running a software implementation of AES and we tried to influence the distribute of a single byte before uh, this, the distribution of a single byte before the last mixed column application with the help of a single clock glitch. What I have uh, pictured here in the diagram is the squared Euclidean imbalance which we have uh, used as a measure for the non-uniformity of this byte. And the red line uh, shows the non-uniformity or the squared Euclidean imbalance, which we get uh, if we guess the correct key. And the blue line here shows the highest value we get for any wrong key. So all wrong keys are in the blue area below here. And what you can see in this diagram is that we need about uh, 30, 40 ciphertexts to reliably distinguish the correct uh, four keypads from the from the wrong for keypads, and as I've promised before, uh, the, the attack is quite robust. So to show this, and out of curiosity, we have performed another experiment, namely instead of inserting a single clock glitch, we have inserted 50 clock glitches in consecutive cycles, and the result show that the attack even works better now. So we only need uh, 25. Uh, for the cipher text now to recover or to reliably recover the correct key. And if you're curious how many faults you need if you attack a smart card microcontroller via laser, I can tell you it's around 50. So uh, to conclude, we have shown that uh, statistical fault attacks are a powerful tool in practice if you attack unprotected uh, implementations. We have also pointed out that, in general, the nonce is not enough to protect authenticated encryption schemes against fault attacks. And, and, uh, and at last, I still want to emphasize that the attacks do not have anything to do with weaknesses of the shown algorithms or weaknesses of AES. They work on a wider range of <coughs> modes and schemes, but of course, uh, to say anything about the applicability, one have to uh, evaluate and look at these modes. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah as, as I've mentioned, you have to look 
uh, at, the, at the concrete scheme to say anything. So I don't want to say without having a picture anything about the, ca uh, the capability of certain schemes. Uh, right from this topic at the beginning, yeah. don't we have to make some assumption about what is the effect of the change on the uh, one bug uh, around the for the end in order to create the statistics that change? For example, uh, when you are doing the clock glitches, yeah. Yeah. The old value of yeah. the bytes, yeah. which is absolutely the form which predicted. Yeah. So, in what sense, if you keep the uh, the uh, one earlier value, which is uniform, why would you have got to see any uh, uh, non uniform statistics? Um, that, that's a good question. So, um, if, if you skip an instruction, then you will most surely not see, uh, see a uniform distribution, right? But if you shoot with a laser on it, then laser yeah, laser and laser yeah, exactly. And and with a with a clock glitch, you also have. I'm not not an expert in this, but I imagine that you have um, different delays of the signals which are tra uh, which are traveling, and also some different differences on the chip on the quality of the single transistors that if you shortly glitch that some values sampled not performance but some intermediate during the calculation and obviously as since we've tried out uh, this value has some uh, bias or luckily <laughs> for us yeah. Yeah. In this case you should stress that uh, uh, your attack depends in a very strong way on uh, your ability to create Yes. Some yes. Not all point effects uh, are going to work. Yeah. Yes. Th exactly. Yeah. That. That's why we did the practical experiments to okay. some somehow verify our assumption. Okay. So uh, the second one. Actually, we have. Yeah, in, 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 the, in the case of the, so I didn't do the attacks, but so I can tell you what others have told me. So in the case of laser fault attacks, it was quite tricky since the, it, it was an AES coprocessor which runs on the own, which has, the, uh, which, which has its own uh, operating system and runs on its own clock. And the only uh, thing which is kind of observable to an attack is when the microcontroller sends the command to start an encryption. And so uh, what they did is wait for this command and add a time delay to the laser and then shoot at a certain point and see if it worked out. Thank you. Yeah. 